So um, I think what you're witnessing in these relapsed vegans are folks who had a very powerful meat dependency spawn and they're still having trouble getting past it. What's going on YouTube, Klaus here. We're in New York City outside the Hilton Hotel because I've been lucky enough to be invited to an amazing plant-based event called The Real Truth About Health. I'll link their page and their uh, website down below. Please visit their page if you want to hear some amazing plant-based talks. Earlier today, I was uh, honored to speak to Dr. Michael Clapper. We've had him on the channel before and he was an amazing guest and interviewee again today. We spoke about uh, ex-vegans like Bonnie Rebecca, we spoke about the upcoming film The Game Changers, and we also spoke about the rise of the carnivore diet. I really think you enjoy the interview. Please enjoy and I'll see you soon. Dr. Clapper, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for doing this interview. I really, really appreciate your time. Uh, I've got loads of stuff I want to ask you about today, including uh, the game changes, which I know you've seen, tips for people that have gone from being vegan to eating meat, and um, lots of other stuff. First up, though, I want to talk about the uh, carnivore diet, which is uh, something that's kind of trending on YouTube. A lot of people, or one or two people uh, on YouTube, claim that eating an all meat diet, often organ, organic meat, is really, really healthy for them. What's your take? Right. Uh, some of the most common health damaging foods that people eat are oils, uh, olive oil, coconut oil, etc., flour products in baked goods, etc., uh, and um, dairy products. And these carnivore diets, they eliminate the oil, the dairy, and the flour products, and people feel better, no question about it. They lose weight, trim down, and that's what you're seeing. But this is an early beneficial trend from removing these toxic substances. The problem is we are not carnivorous apes. We are not house cats or mountain lions. And you keep packing that colon full of meat three times a day for six months, a year, five years. This is a great way to give yourself colon cancer, great way to set off autoimmune diseases, great way to set off colitis in your colon, great way with all the fat to give yourself type 2 diabetes. Nobody's ever lived on a carnivore diet for a year or five years or 10 years. These people do not know what they are talking about. This is a totally unproven, bizarre uh, way to nourish the human body. We are not carnivorous apes. And, um, and people who stay on it, you, well, you can't stay on this diet. The high protein diets injure the kidney. High protein diets are toxic to the kidneys. These folks are writing themselves a, a ticket to the dialysis machine. Um, they, I read this article about this guy who did a carnivore diet for a month and he felt good. That's one month, 30 days. I say, you go back and see this gentleman after six months of eating like that, a year, 18, two and 24 months of eating like this, you're going to see a very ill man with sick kidneys uh, and probably an early colon cancer brewing in his colon. This is not a healthy diet for homo sapiens. And uh, plus uh, the audacity to say, oh, this is the best diet. Everybody ought to be eating that. Are they talking about a flesh-based diet for eight billion people three times a day? What an arrogant, elitist, outrageous, planet-destroying uh, uh, approach to nutrition. It's totally outrageous, both on a physiologic level as well as an ecological level. Uh, it's, it's a dead end of nutritional history, and the sooner it, it ends, the, the better we'll all be. Wow, that's uh, pretty powerful. Um, can we kind of give a couple of broader reasons though why people shouldn't have like a low carb um, ketogenic diet? Our body has the ability to slip into the state of ketosis, which means that we're burning fats for fuel. And it's a useful and necessary physiologic adaption. Uh, a million years ago on the African savannas, I'm sure our ancient foraging ancestors would have to go four or five days before they found the next berry bush with fruit on it. And these enforced five-day fasts were probably the rule. And our body slips into the state of ketosis and uh, the body conserves energy. It cleans out old cells. It's a, it's a healthy thing to do for a short period of time. And so I'm all for people doing these brief intermittent fasts once a month for four or five days. A brief spell of ketosis is fine. The problem is that we're Americans, that if a little is good, more must be better. 
And so if, a, if five days in ketosis is good for you, well, how about a month in ketosis? How about three months? Let's stay in ketosis. Well, ketosis is a state of stress. Those ketones are acidic. Uh, it's a state of low-grade acidosis. I think it's a stress on the bones, on the liver, on the kidneys. Uh, this is not a state you want to stay in for long periods of time. And we've just lately learned uh, that the real magic for the body is not in staying in ketosis, it's coming out of ketosis. When, when you've been in ketosis about five days and then you start eating the vegetables and the glucose and the phytonutrients sweep through your cells, whoa, your stem cells wake up from this uh, suspension that they've been in from the fast. Uh, they start putting out better, less injurious antibodies. They build new, better white cells. Uh, it's the coming out of ketosis that is really healing from the body. It's not staying in ketosis week after week after week. They've got the science uh, misunderstood severely. So whether it's a vegan ketogenic diet or an animal based one, it doesn't matter. To, uh, you don't want to stay in ketosis more than five, seven days, ten at the most, and, and then, then come out of it with a healthy diet. The, we are carbohydrate burning organisms. Our mitochondria burn glucose, not fats. Our preferred fuel is sugars uh, from whole plant foods. And if you eat that in a nice, light, healthy, whole food uh, diet, you won't need to do a whole lot of fasting. You're not going to develop high blood pressure or any of these diseases. So eat whole plant foods and most of this becomes academic. You mentioned that people um, don't need to do like fasting on a whole food plant-based diet. What positive benefits have you experienced from um, a plant-based diet? When I first adopted a whole food plant-based diet, my body loved it. Within 12 weeks, a 20-pound spare tire of fat melted off my waist, my high blood pressure normalized, my high cholesterol normalized, and I felt great waking up in a nice, lean, light body every day. And it was a ringing validation that this is what this body should be eating. And in my medical practice, when I had patients who were overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes, put them on a whole food plant-based diet, the same transformation happens. The obesity melts away, the arteries open up, the high blood pressure comes down, the joints stop hurting, the asthmatic lungs stop wheezing, the migraine headaches go away, and they turn into normal, healthy people. It's the greatest health transformation I've ever seen, and it makes medicine fun to see your patients get healthy. And in terms of the people that you've treated, can you mention maybe an awe-inspiring transformation that you've seen that maybe would best like showcase uh, the beneficial effects of a whole food plant-based diet? Uh, I served on the staff at True North Health Center for eight years in Santa Rosa, California, and I remember distinctly a, a gentleman in his late 50s, a physiotherapist, uh, actually came in with such bad clogged arteries he could not walk across the courtyard uh, without turning gray, holding his chest, and taking a nitroglycerin tablet because his angina was so bad. Uh, we did a brief water fast and then put him on a really lean, clean, whole food, plant-based diet. Within two weeks, uh, he was walking around the building, uh, and within a month, uh, he was walking up hills. His angina just went away, and he, he turned into this youthful, energetic man. Uh, his spirits went up. He didn't have the, the specter of death hanging over him, and, and he reclaimed his life. It was just a wonderful thing to see, and again, the power of plants. Wow, that's um, incredible. In terms of you mentioned the power of plants there. What kind of clinical studies, if you had to pick one, would best showcase the beneficial effects of a plant-based diet? So, if, for example, you're talking to a medical student and you had to show them, like, one study, what would it be? Uh, are the before and after angiograms of the left anterior descending artery that Dr. Esselstyn showed to see these terrible plaques encroaching into the blood flow channel of this artery melt away and it turns back into a healthy artery. Every cardiologist who sees those two images should say, stop the presses. What did you do here, doctor? How did you create this? This is my entire life. This is the entire specialty of cardiology. Tell me the secret of how you produced this. And a whole food plant-based diet without excessive oils and sugars will do exactly that. What a powerful, powerful medical modality that is. So hands down, that's the most dramatic uh, effect I've seen of a whole food plant-based diet. Wow, that's, yeah, that's amazing. And can you quickly talk about why a whole food plant-based diet is really good for weight loss and maybe give some tips for, for weight loss? 
most every vegan I know who is eating a truly whole food, plant-based diet, eating foods as grown as they grew in the garden or grew in the field, is a lean person. Uh, you don't see obese vegans who are eating whole food. Why not? Because whole plant foods, nature and her wisdom, makes them largely out of fiber and water. No matter what the vegetable is, whether it's kale or broccoli or melons or green peas, when you analyze it, they're mostly fiber and water. And when you eat a big, huge salad, you filled your tummy up largely with fiber and water, and uh, the water gets excreted out in the urine, the fiber passes out in the stool. There's so little calorie density, density there that nothing really sticks to you. And the glory of uh, eating a whole food, plant-based diet is there's no portion control. Whether you go back for a fourth bowl of vegetable soup, who cares, it's vegetable soup. It's all fiber and water. You pee it right out, it doesn't stick to you. So it's tailor-made for weight loss. It's beauty. It's beautiful for the patients who've been so concerned how many calories and what, how I gotta weigh my portions and how many carbs there. It really doesn't matter if you're eating whole plant foods. That your, your satiety will take care of that for you. Now the key is whole plant foods. If you know Oreos are vegan and, uh, and uh, granola bars and energy drinks, uh, will put weight on you. And uh, excessive nut butters, these are processed foods. But as long as you're sticking to food as grown, how many apples can you eat? And you wind up nice and lean, even though you're eating lots of food, because the calorie density is so low, because the fiber and water content is so high. And the next question is about ex-vegans, because a lot of, um, uh, well, a few YouTube personalities recently have gone back to eating animal products. From your experience, what are the main reasons people uh, kind of ditch their plant-based diet? Um, the two reasons I think uh, people go back to eating meat, uh, one is largely social pressure. They just get tired of being the odd person out at the restaurant and at home or cooking two meals for their spouses or whatever. So uh, most of it is social. But the folks who truly have a real meat craving and really uh, desire it, I think it has to do with the food we eat as infants. Um, when you think about it, at age six months of age, when the baby is still nursing on the breast, with all the love in the parents' hearts, that jar of baby lamb, baby chicken, baby turkey is opened, and at that point, three times a day, animal flesh is slathered on that child's intestine. By age two or three, they're in the fast food restaurant eating their Happy Meals. They're off to a plant, they're off to an animal-based diet. <clears throat> and if you eat meat three times a day through your, through infancy, childhood, through adolescent, puberty, through your teens, your 20s, your 30s, you eat animal flesh three times a day, you're going to get dependent upon the carnitine, creatine, the muscle-based nutrients that are coming in with the food. Your body makes them, but if they've been coming in preformed three times a day since infancy, what are your genes gonna do? They're gonna downregulate their own production of carnitine and creatine because it's coming in preformed three times a day. Well, that works as long as you're still eating it. Of course, you're brewing up a bunch of different diseases along with, with it. But if you suddenly then stop, you, you go see Forks Over Knives or you read John Robbins' book and the plant-based light goes on and you stop eating flesh suddenly, well, your body's still looking for those preformed nutrients. Now you've got to make them all on your own. Now, most people can gear up their genes and their enzymes to start synthesizing their own carnitine, creatine, but some folks might be a bit slower. It might take six months or a year before they're really manufacturing that, and they get meat cravings. And when they eat meat and that preformed carnitine, creatine washes through their tissues, whoa, I feel great. Vegan, schmegan, man, I'm a carnivore. I need my meat. And they do, but this is not normal human physiology. This is an acquired dependency created by feeding a human infant animal flesh three times a day in infancy. No primate does that, no gorilla does that, no bonobo does that. We didn't used to either. We used to raise our kids on, on oat gruels and things. Um, <clears throat> Back throughout American history, the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, people lived on farms and you may have had pot roast on Sunday and fish on Friday, but that was it, man. You, you ate out of your garden the rest of the week. You ate cabbage stews and potato soups. 
you didn't go killing your chickens every night for buffalo wings. Uh, you, you run out of chickens pretty quickly there. This flesh-based diet is just since World War II, we've been rich enough to, to indulge this. And so we've created all these the whole generations of folks who are really dependent upon animal flesh. But this is not normal human physiology. I've seen three generations of children raised as vegans, and they turn into lean, healthy, bright people who don't have meat cravings. Their mouths don't water when they walk past a barbecue. Uh, these are healthy folks. They're physiologically different folks. So um, I think what you're witnessing in these relapsed vegans are folks who had a very powerful meat dependency spawn, and they're still having trouble getting past it. I tell them that, you know, if you have to eat meat once a week for a while, you know, just stretch out the time in between and, and eventually your body gears up so you don't need this stuff. I had meat cravings for years after I became vegan and it, it really bothered me. And for a short period of time, I went back to having some fish to see if it would make any difference in my, in my uh, physical being. Didn't. Um, but, but it was a strong meat craving. But it was mostly just that chewy, salty texture I craved more than anything else, I think. So, um, so if people have to uh, dabble in that for a little while, I don't condemn them. But I say don't linger there either. Get, you know, get on with uh, phasing that stuff out of your diet as expeditiously as possible. It would be cool to ask um, uh, about a question we've been asking and collaborating with a lot of physicians on the title of the video which we're going to publish pretty soon, is called What Happens to Your Body uh, When You Eat Bacon? I know it might sound a bit stupid, but everyone or everyone in the mainstream loves bacon. So, um, yeah, what happens to your body when you eat bacon? Well, there's several problems with bacon. Uh, when you say everybody loves bacon, no. Everybody may love a salty, chewy kind of sweet texture in their mouth is what they really like. Uh, and I've seen vegan versions of that. But uh, at the, the cost of eating that salty, chewy, kind of sweet substance on a frequent basis, as it, it puts this cooked, fried uh, animal protein uh, down in your intestines. Um, it is an, it's full of oxidizing agents that will oxidize cholesterol in your blood and, and injure your artery walls, setting up for heart attacks and strokes. And uh, smoked meats and, and these kind of preserved meats have been shown to be a class one carcinogen. Uh, and if you are eating it on a regular basis and those carcinogens are smearing on your colon wall day after day after day after day, that's a great way to brew up a really aggressive cancer of the colon. Uh, this is uh, not human food. This is a novelty food that we te tease our taste buds with. Uh, but as far as what it really does in the body, uh, it's a great way to give yourself artery disease and colon cancer and should not be viewed as a health food by any stretch of imagination. Thank you for the, the concise answer. The next question is quite a big topic, um, but if you could try and answer it in a minute or two, that would be really good. Um, it's basically why do physicians and healthcare systems and institutions not recommend a plant-based diet? You've mentioned the beneficial effects of a plant-based diet and the detrimental effects of meat and dairy and like bacon. Um, but yeah, why is this not recommended? For example, type two diabetes, we know we can uh, reverse that disease, yet nobody's really talking about it. I love being a physician. I love the practice of medicine. I love the profession of medicine. But I must admit, I carry an ache in my heart and a burning flame uh, of despair, anger, resentment at this huge hole in my medical education. Uh, that most of my colleagues now have been practicing medicine, and we practice medicine. Like, what our patients are eating has no effect on these diseases. Oh, it's some genetic problem. When the reality is, doctor, that's why your patient is sitting in front of you, overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up, and inflamed from, from the meat and dairy and oils and sugars they've been eating. And to not ask the person, what do you eat? Uh, take me through a typical eating day, is, I think, grossly neglectful. Uh, because that's where the diabetes is coming from. And we don't appreciate this because the doctors are eating the pizzas and the burgers themselves. They don't want to be bothered with us. But the truth is the truth. And type 2 diabetes is a disease of fat toxicity. And all the meat and the cheese and the oils and the fast foods clog up the insulin receptors in the, in the muscle cells so insulin doesn't work and blood sugars go up. The problem is all the fats that we're eating. 
Uh, and, and when people go on whole food plant-based diet, they burn that fat out of, of their muscle cells and the diabetes goes away. This is a reversible disease, predictably so. And yet the young medical students are not taught this and it's, it's an outrageous omission. Uh, so much so that I left uh, my clinical practice and I'm devoting the rest of my career to going from medical school to medical school and giving these young students the lecture I wish someone had given me 50 years ago. That, you, listen, young people, young doctors, you're not going to be seeing leprosy and smallpox. It's what your patients are eating. It's the obesity and diabetes and clogged arteries from, from the American diet and the Western diet. And get real with that. Otherwise, you're going to get frustrated and leave medicine. But if you can work with their diet, send them to the plant-based dietitian, they'll get healthy right before your eyes. And I tell them, and it's a provocative statement, but I say, you want, I put up a slide with all these degenerative diseases, clogged arteries, hypertension, diabetes, autoimmune disease, and I ask a very powerful question. You want, these are all reversible diseases. You want to cure these patients or don't you? Why did you go into medicine? I did not go into medicine to manage chronic disease. I went in to cure people. And these are all curable diseases, every one of them. And to, and to not be honest with your patients. And to, and to be the cardiologist who says, oh, Joe, you can keep eating your pepperoni pizzas and your cheeseburgers and your buffalo wings, but take your statins so I can't get sued because this is, I've, I've met my obligation. I gave you statins, but go ahead, eat your burgers, it's fine. That to me is, is beyond inadequate, uh, that, that injures the patient, and it, and it destroys the joy of medicine, uh, where the, the cardiologists say, ah, they all get sick, or they all need stents, they all need stents. That's right, doctor, if you don't talk to them about what they're eating, yes, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But that's, you're not serving the patient, that's not good medicine, we know better than that. So plant-based medicine should have been taught uh, in medical schools when I started. I shouldn't have to be going around to the medical schools and delivering this message. It should be taught to them in the curriculum that they're learning. Uh, but that's not where we're at. So my mission from this point on uh, is to bring this message uh, to the nation's medical schools and get plant-based nutrition taught as it properly should. It's the most powerful, inexpensive, and satisfying tool any physician can use. And, and we need to place it in their hands. So. Uh, the reason why it's not taught is because it's not taught, and it's appalling uh, uh, beyond ignorance of, um, of the power of food uh, to create health or disease. Hippocrates had it right, and it's, it's the food, it's the food, it's the, let food be your medicine. And, and the joy comes back to medicine um, because of the second phrase that Hippocrates said. He said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And everyone understands the first part. Let, yeah, oh, let food be your medicine. Okay. But that second part, and medicine be thy food. What does that mean? You know, you, they eat a bottle of pills for dinner? What's he saying? I now know what that means. My patients who are clogged up and diabetic and hypertensive, the food is their medicine. I said, the medicine is their food in that I, it changes how you view the, your meals. And so you sit down to dinner with your clogged arteries and your diabetes, and you look at that cell and say, oh, that cell, oh, that's medicine for my arteries. Oh, that kale, that's medicine for me. Now that cantaloupe chunks, oh, that's medicine for me. Let medicine be your food. Let every one of these meals heal you. Let, let, let that open your arteries. Let that reduce your blood pressure. And food becomes medicine at that point. It's a beautiful concept. Doctors need to know that because patients get healthy right before your very eyes. And, and, the, and the patient leaves your office with, with, off their medications, feeling good, looking good, and as they leave, you go, yes! Uh, and that's the best moment in medicine, and it's available to all of us. There is uh, a film coming out which I think will make a big difference. It's called The Game Changers. I know you've seen it. What was your take? Oh, thank heavens for the game changers. That is a game changer. It's a well-named movie. And I know quite a number of the folks in there. I, I certainly am good friends with uh, Rip Esselstyn and uh, recently met Dotsy Bosch, the uh, cyclist. And what a remarkable woman she is. And uh, I have such respect uh, for the f people in the movie, but the people who made the movie, that was, uh, that was like a precise judo chop, you know, for the, for the 
athletic guys who were afraid to go vegan because they turned them into wusses. That it was a precision uh, piece of uh, filmmaking. That was exactly what they needed to see. So it potentially can be, can be a game changer if it helps these big macho guys see that uh, eating meat is not necessary for, for strength and athletic performance. Uh, it's performed a huge service. I think it would be shown around the world because uh, people, I need my meat for strength. And you obviously don't. Ask any gorilla or buffalo, they'll tell you the same thing. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, the Game Changer was made and I hope it gets very wide circulation. I'm really, really looking forward to watching it. I spoke to uh, Dr. Gregor about it and he saw the first draft as well and he said it's the best, I think he said plant-based documentary in human history. Um, I think it's now on hold because they're working out a distribution plan and I think they're uh, filming Lewis Hamilton, he's a pretty big name, so it'll be um, pretty exciting. But I had a question about, you know, specific scenes and do any of them sort of stand out to you? For example, the Dr. Spit scene where he's talking about erections. Um, it reflected, of course, uh, the Sub Rosa theme is manhood uh, there. And you know, there are two places that it showed up quite noticeably. One is when they got these three young football players and they put a pressure measuring collar around their penis to see how strong their erections were. And it was very profound. What an elegant uh, demonstration of physiology that uh, the meat uh, kept their blood vessels from dilating and gave them a strong erection. And the guy with the vegan diet had the biggest, strongest erection. That probably, and <laughs> I rest my case, uh, at that point, uh, the, uh, the point was made. But I was very impressed with um, uh, Mr. Mander, the, um, the uh, fellow in South Africa who guards against the rhino poaching. And this man, woo, uh, this is one tough dude. And, but his heart is pure. He's given his, his uh, energy to helping the animals. And, he's, and he had the integrity to say, I can't be protecting the one big animal and eating another one. And due to his integrity and his pure heart, he became a vegan. And his performance got better. And you see him crashing through the bush, leading his crew behind him with superb athletic performance. That's, that's really athletic performance, not just to score points, but to help this planet. And he's doing it on a vegan diet. So uh, those two were by far the uh, most impactful scenes in the movie for me. And, and I hope everybody uh, appreciates them. There, there's a lot of meaning in those scenes. Thank you so much for doing this interview. I really, really appreciate it. I know you've been in the movement for uh, around 30 years, I think over 30 years. Um, are you finally sort of excited that the movement's picking up steam uh, and everything's sort of taking off or is change not really happening quickly enough? I became vegan in 1981, 38 years ago. And nothing but good things have happened to me on every level of my physical body. It's certainly made medicine much more satisfying and it's given me hope uh, for the animals, for the kids, for the planet. It really is uh, our way through this dark, dark place that we're in as far as our personal health goes, our social situation and, and the environment and the stability of our planet. It's clear that the message is coming through to us that if we want to be healthy as individuals and survive as a species. The task before us is to, we must now evolve our diets to a plant-based diet. Uh, for each individual person who wants to avoid a heart attack, a stroke, a cancer, start eating a plant-based diet. It's without question the way to avoid these diseases. But if there's any hope to stabilize this planet, uh, we are, as a species, we have to see we have used meat-eating up no matter what the mighty hunter did for us or whatever, whoever he was, he got us here, that page, that chapter's over. That page is time to turn. Fishing, we have used fishing up. We've used the oceans up. We must let them heal. On every level, the earth is saying enough. No matter what you did before, it doesn't matter. At the time, if you want to stay on this planet, take a lesson from the gorillas and the buffaloes and start eating plants. If we do, we can save ourselves. The forest will come back, so much less land will be needed. The soils will stabilize, the waters will run pure again. There'll be enough food for everyone to eat and the greenhouse gases will be absorbed by the forests that are regrowing. Now, it could save our futures. If we don't do that, 
I don't see much hope, as uh, Dr. Richard Oppenlander really eloquently put it in his book called Comfortably Unaware, Comfortably Unaware, which is right where the meat and dairy industries want us. Uh, it's okay, keep eating your burgers, don't worry about you know, what it does to the planet, keep eating, don't be comfortably unaware. And he makes it very clear that you can put solar panels on everybody's house, you can give an electric car to everybody on earth, but unless we change our diets, unless we stop raising and slaughtering 70 billion animals every year, every one of whom is breathing out carbon dioxide, every one of them is belching out methane, they're all eating grains grown with ammonia fertilizers, putting nitrous oxide in the air, unless we stop doing that, Nothing is going to make any difference. Those greenhouse gases are going to continue to increase and the seas are going to continue to rise. So it's past a social nicety at this point. It's our life raft. It's, it's the way out it's, and it's a narrow door, but we've got to run through it at this point. And where the vegans have always been the weird, fringy folks, the truth is they are holding the light saying this way. You want to be healthy. You want to you want to have your kids have a livable planet. It's time to adopt a plant-based diet uh, by all human beings. So this nice fringe movement has turned out to really be our salvation for our entire species. And the vegans have, a, I think, an obligation to be as healthy as they can, to be as generous as they can, to set a good example as they can, to enjoy the heck out of the food, make some dynamite chilies and soups, and, and, and bring people along with the, the joy of this wonderful way of eating and it will become a more peaceful planet and a more stable and sustainable planet and, and that will truly give us hope for the future. Is it too late? Might be, but I don't see any other choice. And if I can, uh, every time I see a little kid in a stroll, I, I feel like going over there kneeling down and apologizing to them for what we've done to their planet. And I owe these kids. I'm working for the kids and the animals at this point. It's their planet. We've messed it up. The least I can do is help that planet heal by getting people to start eating plant-based diets. And so uh, that's my mission for the rest of my time on this planet. And I invite everybody to join in their own personal lives and the example they set. And if we all do that, uh, we'll make a better world.